Hello, and welcome to another episode of Let's Play Fighters Anthology, the Vietnam Campaign. I'm your host, Splinter. So, last time we did the first mission of the Vietnam Campaign, where we did pretty amazing against the Vietnamese, and then we did not so amazing on our carrier landing. So let's see if we can uh, do a little better on that this time. Paul Doomer Bridge, USS Kitty Hawk, CVA 63, date May 10th, local time 1300 hours, weather clear. Situation, one of the primary targets of the initial strikes was the Paul Doomer Bridge near Hanoi, and I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right. The object of many raids in the 60s, many unsuccessful due to the inaccuracy of dumb glide bombs, the bridge had been completely rebuilt by 1972. In linebacker, United States Air Force F-4s, armed with laser and TV-guided ordnance, destroyed the structure during a single raid. In a small rewrite of history, Navy pilots from the Kitty Hawk are tasked with destroying this landmark target. Mission objective, your wing makes up the initial strike team. You and your wingmen must carry enough ordnance to take out the middle span of the bridge. A4s will precede you and suppress flak and SAM batteries, flak and SAM sites in the area. F4Js will fly a target combat air patrol as you make your ingress. Re order of battle recommended aircraft F4J, recommended weapons GBU-10, cave knife, AIM-9B, threat suppression data, ground opposition, SA-2s, KS-19s, KS-12s, air opposition, X-17s. Okay. So here's our map. Let's just get an idea. Go up to the river and we come out again. Take the same plane. And now for our loadout, what we're gonna do is Okay. Let's get looks like we'll have to get a little creative with our there we go. I only want two of those because I don't want to be... I don't want to get dragged down in a dogfight and waste a bunch of bombs. So then we'll take our Dave Knife Laser Designator Pod, which if you don't take that, you can't guide your bombs, so we'll take that. And uh, let's go. And as a side note, the uh, our wingman has the exact same... Um, has the exact same ordinance we take. So, let's go and look at them there. So, there are some radar. Let's do a sweep. See if there's any other contacts near us. It looks like it's mainly ground contacts. and then friendly air targets, which is what we want at this stage. Alright, everything's looking good. So we'll go back to our ingress. And you can see how they model the, uh, they essentially model the Phantom with a uh, 25 nautical mile range, which may have been accurate for that time period. I think later they got it up to 50 or 75 maybe, but... And let's see, let's switch to air ground mode and see if we can come up with our targets. Ah, there we go. There's our target, so... Right over there. One, three, so let's take her off of our pilot. And we will switch to our laser pistol here. Let's climb a little bit because I'm always a fan of releasing ordnance from as high as possible to stay out of SAM range. Let's 
so we're about two miles from our ingress point. Let's check on the radar again, and we see the MiGs are closing in. So hopefully our friends here will deal with them. If not, we're going to have to dogfight. So let's let's roll in now. And we see we aren't in range yet. Eight miles. So we'll wait a little bit until we get in range. Eight miles. Seven miles. Let's see if we're in range yet. Nope. Six miles. See for a range. Oh, we should be. Range, so. Four miles. Out away. Mile. Now we're gonna slow down because I do not know if the uh, how much range that tracker has. So let's watch the bomb as it comes in. Looks good so far. And we have a good hit. So let's do a sweep. It looks like we still have targets in the air. Let's give our wingman some strong time. We'll let him take out the, uh, the bandit while we swing around for a second pass on the bridge. So let's gain some altitude here. And our wingman will be at a disadvantage once that gets into the dogfight since he, like I said earlier, they do take the same loadout that you do, which is a little unfortunate. I'd like to give them different loadouts, but let's uh, let's go. We'll let that bomb go, and now let's steady our course. And this one should finish the bridge. Three miles. Looks like we're still dead on. Check our six because I see my. I see this flashing. I don't know if that's the game thinking this guy's guided or what, but. Well, I, it is guided, but not in any way we could detect. And there's the bridge. So now let's switch over to our winders, spool up the engines, and we can go and help our wingman out. Turning left. Let's reduce the range on our radar. We don't need to see 25 miles out. Let's kick in the burners. Now, something that I believe is normally protocol for Navy and Air Force pilots is, if you notice on our loadout screen, we carry drop tanks. Unfortunately, the game's not so advanced that we can see that in our own model, but we carry drop tanks, and normally it's... I believe it's policy for fighter pilots to jettison all their air to ground ordnance as well as dog or <coughs> excuse me, as well as drop tanks before entering into a dog fight. And the reason for this is one, it gives you better maneuverability. And two is if you do get hit, you know, at least it's not blowing up a bomb or a fuel tank under your wing or something. Don't want that happen. So let's zoom in for the kill on this guy. You might think we'll just have to gun him down. And that's one bandit splashed. And 
those guys are searching, so... White Squadron is searching, Blue 2 is forming up, so I guess that was all of them. So let's turn the autopilot back on. We we'll tell our wingman to disengage just in case he sees anyone else. We can thank these guys for suppressing the air defenses around the target. And that gives us a 50 mile trip or so back to the ship. So that mission ended up being a lot easier than I remember. So that gives us a chance to talk again. And remember, if there's any questions you have, I can do my best to answer them about any, you know, aircraft, weapons, etc. From, you know, this era or any of the other eras that we do or modern stuff. But, um, so yesterday we talked about the MiGs. So today let's talk about the, uh, the U.S. aircraft. Now, what we're flying, the F-4J Phantom, is a... An upgrade of the original F-4Bs, I think they were F-4Bs, that the Navy had. And the F-4B was the interceptor version, you know, it didn't have any sort of cannon on it. Uh, it was designed more for speed than anything else. Now the J version, I believe, had slats added to enhance maneuverability, uh, upgraded engines, and a couple other additions, including um, an underslung cannon that they kind of just bolted on. Uh, one of those Su-16 pods like you can see in our loadout and that was designed based on experience from operating the B model in the Vietnam War where these guys kept getting the dogfights and you know their missiles would fail or, and they'd use them all up and then they had you know or they just couldn't use them like in our case where we were approaching them make head on and we couldn't lock onto it because the sidewinders and other infrared missiles of this era are rear aspect only they can only lock onto an aircraft from the rear quadrants where they can see the engine. So, you know, in our case, we couldn't use the missiles. If we had no cannon, we wouldn't have been able to do anything. And, uh, and I think overall performance is slightly boosted by the new engines, too. Uh, we do have a much more powerful radar, though, than our counterparts in this game, the MiG-21 and the MiG-17. And we're supposed to be using it to guide it, guide in the Sparrow missiles, but those don't always work, so... In any case, it does give us a bit better detection range. Um, see. Now, uh, there is one other aircraft that we can actually fly in this campaign, other than the B and J Phantom variants. And that's the F-8 Crusader. Now that was a um, that was an aircraft designed, I believe, during the Vietnam War, but didn't enter service until afterwards. Well, that guy's having a bad day. Sounds like he'll be staying at the Hanoi Hilton. But um, yeah, so the FHJ that was the last dogfighter that the Navy designed prior to Vietnam, you know, with the Phantom, you know, they envisioned all their future fighters would just be missile trucks. So, the Crusader is unique in that it, it does have a radar, or at least it's modeled as having one in this game. I think it had one in real life, but it wasn't very powerful. And that radar was, in the game at least, is only good for about five nautical miles. So in that sense, it's equivalent to the MiG-21. It also can't carry a lot of ordnance. I mean, you, I think you can put a few bombs and rocket pods on it, but you don't have a lot of hard points to work with. And typically, what you'll have is maybe two to four sidewinders to work with. But the unique thing about the Crusader in comparison to the Phantoms is it had, I forget if it was two or four 20 millimeter cannons with 150 bombs each, I think. And so, what the Navy found during the conflict was that the couple Crusaders that they still had in service that were being phased out, they were performing better in dogfights than the Phantoms. So the Navy kept them on probably a bit longer than they would have otherwise, and they ended up taking on the nickname The Last Gunfighters. 
and uh, it is an option to use. I don't think we'll be using it because, again, I'm going to try to stick to the Phantom as much as possible. But it is there, and it does maneuver. I don't notice much of a difference. I don't know if that's just me or if that's just the uh, the way the game works. Because, yeah, as I mentioned in the earlier episodes, this isn't a very... Um, it's not the most realistic flight sim. I mean, you can see from our targeting thing over there, which, you know, maybe the F-35 will be able to give you something like this with its targeting suite, but uh, not in any of these fighters that will be flying in this game. But the in terms of mo flight modeling, I think what they did was they created a standard flight model, and then they just tweaked the values to fit each aircraft. So, you know, they might have cut the turn rate down on, you know, if you fly an AC-130. You know, or maybe they uh, boosted your top speed if you take an F-14 or something. So, we're all these aircraft are f basically running off the same flight model, I believe. That's just been tuned, depending on which aircraft you're flying. Whereas if you uh, look at sims like DCS, what you'll see there is each aircraft has its own individual flight model and that gives you a lot more realism, a lot more fidelity. And um, if you're looking for a hardcore sim, I would definitely recommend DCS. It's, I mean, you basically gotta learn how to fly the real aircraft in order to fly it in that game. But if you're, for those who might be interested in picking up this game, there's not really a lot of options to um, to get this anymore, unfortunately. Um, so this game uh, was produced by a partnership between Jane's Defense Industries. I think they're known as IHS now because they got bought out, but they were, uh, or they are, they're. Um, one of the most prominent defense publications out there and they basically assemble um, you know all sorts of information on you know every gun every weapon every vehicle every aircraft every truck every tank every ship you name it they got it and you know they publish this information for a price of course uh, you can get some abbreviated stuff at your local bookstore if you're lucky but um, the big books that have all the information, those cost like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. But um, they uh, entered into a collaboration with EA back in the 90s to develop a, a series of mainly flight sims. Um, US, United States Navy fighters and its expansions and advanced tactical fighters and its expansions, both of which got combined into Fighters Anthology. That was part of it. Uh, they did the Apache Longbow and Apache Longbow 2 games and their expansions. They did, um, they did two different World War II games, I think. Um, I think one was just World War II Fighters, and I forget the name of the other one. But those were, um, those were pretty decent games. Um, they did, uh, United States Air Force. Uh, USAF that's kind of a newer version of uh, fighters anthology focusing mainly on the Air Force uh, let's see they did um, they also did uh, the Israeli Air Force which is basically USAF but with featuring uh, IAF campaigns and um, aircraft uh, let's see, and then they did a couple more realistic sims that focused on single aircraft. Uh, you had F-15E Strike Eagle. Uh, I think they did one for the F-A-18 Hornet. That's all I got off the top of my head right now. And then one of their last sims was uh, Fleet Command. And Fleet Command's another good old sim. You know, I used to spend tons of hours playing that as a kid. But uh, fortunately, at some point, for whatever reason, that partnership ended, and I believe EA still owns 
the intellectual property to the games, but it does not seem to enforce it or care about it at all. Because, I mean, I, I haven't seen any of these titles show up on GOG um, or anything like that, so... If you want to get this game, there's a couple ways. You can, um, you can buy this on Amazon or eBay or other online retailers. Because occasionally you can find, like, a, a used copy. Or in my case, I actually found the brand new copy. But the way I'm running it now is I actually got a couple of ISOs that I forget where I got. I think I made them back in the day from a friend who had the discs but nothing else and uh, that's why I'm using in conjunction with VirtualBox to run XP and normally back when I used to run this in VMware I would need also need a program called CPU Grab which I don't even know if you can find that on the internet anymore but what that program did was you see with certain old games for those who don't know uh, they didn't always foresee where the future computing would lead, so on really old games, if you try to run them on modern systems, what you'll sometimes see is that the game runs at an extremely accelerated rate, making it unplayable, because they didn't include any sort of cap on the program running, you know, so when you're running it with a, you know, a 2.4 GHz processor instead of an old 133 Pentium, it, it gets faster. <laughs> uh, which, normally I do have to do it, at least on VMware, and the only reason I'm not using VMware now is something got messed up with that, where it just won't run Windows XP at all. So, now I'm using VirtualBox, and uh, I have the ISO loaded as a CD drive in VirtualBox. And, uh, curiously enough, in VirtualBox, I found I didn't need to run it. I'm guessing I mucked something up that so that's running slower to normal but but uh yeah and you know if you get the, the other place if you want the files is there's a website called oldgames.net i think it's called you can google that and uh, they have a huge archive of their of old games most of them are uh long since unsupported like the old james titles you know ea doesn't seem interested in even defending their ip on that account you know and just other old dead games they you can typically find there and they'll try to extort some money from you to um to support their site and uh it's, i haven't really noticed any ads but then again i use an ad blocker but um They'll try, you know, you can pay them money to get faster downloads. Otherwise, if you're willing to uh, deal with slower downloads, um, and I'm talking like 10% of dial up speed, so you can just get a free download. They limit you to two a day. That's normally not a problem since it takes more than a day to download most of the bigger files, anyways. But you can find files for like Fighters Anthology or the other old James games or uh, you know any other game that's you know dead. And I typically use it as an absolute last resort. You know if I can buy it on Amazon first or if I can buy it on um, you know if I can buy it on GOG or Steam, I'll look there first. But if no one's selling it. It is a place you can use. So they have a good old collection of titles. And I still hope that one day see all the James titles make it to GOG, but it's been a lot of years now and I've seen EA put other stuff on there that they own the IP to, like the, uh, I think they own the IP to Wing Commander, actually. You know, that went up there. Uh, a few other old EA games ended up there. But uh, I haven't seen any of the Janes titles, so I might even be wrong about EA owning the IP on them. Maybe uh, Janes or IHS now owns it. I don't really know what the deal was with, you know, how that deal was set up, but... So yeah, if you're interested in looking for titles, other Janes titles, or this one, that's typically where you can find them. 
see. So this ship, which we will actually see a lot of, but it will do absolutely nothing, is I believe this is a um, a destroyer escort, or maybe a destroyer from World War II that was modified into a a radar picket roll. So basically, the job of this ship is basically just to warn the fleet if there's uh, if there's going to be like uh, incoming aircraft or something. And I think if we uh, let's see here. In fact, I think those are even supposed to be. Those almost looks like the old uh, Talos or rail other rail missile launchers that the Navy used. Uh, back in the day and uh, there we can see the Kitty Hawk off in the distance here the other uh, use for these and you see it a lot I think it was mainly more a World War II thing is there used to be uh, when aircraft were conducting or excuse me when aircraft carriers were conducting recovery operations they normally have a destroyer or a destroyer ex escort steaming kind of back and off to the side and the, the, the theory was you know if you had a bail then the destroyer would just move in and pick you up. And uh, there's actually an old tradition associated with that where the uh, destroyer or destroyer escort would typically ransom the pilot back for uh, ice cream or, you know, some other valuable commodity from the carrier, like perhaps movies or something like that. And you can read up on it. It's pretty interesting. So now we're coming in for our landing now. And hope switch our over to navigation mode, and hopefully we'll do better than uh, last time. So let's let's cut to 18% throttle. Try to go low. Probably a bit far out to deploy now. We'll use time compression to speed this up a little. Let's come to 10,000 feet. Now let's dive to 5,000 right away. I, do, I will admit I don't know exactly what the landing procedure is for uh, for landing an aircraft. That's something I hope to learn one day, but... Alright, so there we are at 5,000 feet. We're almost home. And actually that line there reminds me, in this game, when you hear that, you're basically in a safe zone around the carrier. It extends to about six nautical miles out, as we can see. And uh, basically, if, if I were to hit escape now and go and end the mission, I would not get a landing grade, but it would... Um, actually, why wasn't that coming up? There we go. I wouldn't get a landing grade, but it would recover my aircraft. It wouldn't count as destroyed. It would count as recovered. I would recover all weapons on the aircraft. And, um, you know, it basically counts as a mission success. So, um, and generally I won't use that. But, uh, it is useful on occasion, I will attest. Lower. Lower. Three miles. Lower. 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 Alright. And, um, I remember in one particular instance where I used it. And, um. Fire. 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 And, uh. Fire. <laughs> Dropping a little 
too much there. In any case, uh, once I did use it, uh, once when, um, the, um, my, I was, uh, doing a mission in the Ukraine campaign. And the, uh, my Hornet got shot to hell. They took out the, the hydraulics and everything. Okay, we missed the. We should have done uh, afterburners there. We'll just end because I messed that one up again. And okay, that didn't even count as the landing because I didn't trap a wire. But anyways, I uh, to finish my earlier thought, there was a mission in the Ukraine campaign which we'll get to see where you had to destroy a bunch of uh, hydrofoil missile bolts before they attack the carrier group. And I did it, but between, I think it was mostly Sam's and AAA from the foil boats, I just decided to attack them with dumb bombs to save my more expensive ordnance for later missions. What happened was they shot me up so bad, I had like 90% airframe damage, but they also destroyed my hydraulics. So after a while, I could see the hydraulic fluid was leaking out, so I made as many course corrections as I could. To point my aircraft towards the carrier eventually the hydraulics bled dry and I couldn't move any of my control surfaces and uh, I ended up getting within the safe recovery zone of the carrier so I was able to end mission and save my aircraft but uh, yeah definitely not the uh, most realistic and that's the thing too is if you lose your aircraft it'll be permanently removed from the aircraft pool and you generally fail the mission too so we don't want to do that so there we go. We uh, we destroyed the Paul Doomer bridge. Everyone's alive and happy. We have one fighter kill and uh, one structure. Uh, the bridge. All of our launches were successful. 33% hit on our gun. That's not bad. No one even bothered shooting at us, so let's repair our aircraft. And uh, I guess that's it for this time. Next time we'll be uh, protecting A6s as they uh, as they lay mines around. Was that Thanhoa Harbor? If I'm pronouncing that right. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>